Hello everyone. Good evening and join this presentation with Evan Wiener, an award-winning journalist, radio commentator and TV pundit on MSNBC and ABC. Uh, hello Evan and I'm going to give you the turn and you are going to introduce yourself and uh, uh, talk about yourself to our uh, audience and they are here and we are very fortunate to have you here today and you have done so many presentations i heard that while you were talk you when you were talking to me and thank you very much for being here tonight and uh, please go ahead and uh, introduce yourself uh, what i'm going to do i'm going to mute myself i'm going to come out of uh, video as well uh, if you, if our audience have any questions at the end of the presentation, uh, you can uh, either uh, type on the question box or chat box, and uh, I will uh, then Ivan will take it uh, all those questions and answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, audience coming tonight, and Ivan, uh, please uh, will let us welcome Ivan. Well, thank you for inviting me to the Clinton Macomb Library. My name is Evan Weiner, and um, I've been a journalist since I'm 15 years old. Uh, I started at Spring Valley High School in 1971, a junior on the worst show in the world called Tiger Tie. But by 1978, I was on uh, the big station, WNEW Radio in New York, 1130 on your dial they played sinatra and tony bennett nat king cole peggy lee and all that and i got on the station because i got my first scoop uh, john lindsay the former mayor of new york city somehow told me in his drunken stupor he was running for senate state of new york in 1980 and i had the biggest story in new york that day in march of 1978 and I've interviewed presidential candidates like Ronald Reagan and Ted Kennedy and Jack Kemp and Bill Clinton and covered sports and covered entertainment and uh, a whole menagerie of things. Uh, this particular talk, African-American uh, athletes and protests and all, uh, some of this is uh, interviews that I've done over the years with some of the people here, including somebody uh, who you might know from the Detroit area by the name of Wally Triplett, who played with the Detroit Lions in the late 1940s, uh, also the Chicago Cardinals, uh, and Ralph Kiner, the New York Mets announcer, who told me a lot about uh, the, how the conditions were when Jackie Robinson broke into Major League Baseball, Paul Brown, who hired uh, Negro players in uh, Cleveland, as well and uh, muhammad ali is in here and jim brown and these are guys people who i uh, dealt with so anyway as Woody strode he was uh, a pioneer in the national football league because he helped desegregate the national football league in 1946 after a color barrier was put up after the 1933 season there is Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese there, Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, Jesse Owens, who stole the show, so to speak, at the Hitler Olympics in 1936. Marty Glickman, who I worked with in 1988, was supposed to run in this race. He uh, His place was taken by Jesse. Joe Lewis from Detroit. Um, I never met Joe Lewis or people around him. Uh, I've met like one or two people who actually knew him. Uh, but uh, the Brown Bomber, who uh, was an American patriot. Elgin Baylor, who uh, I dealt with over the years. Um, Elgin Baylor with the Minneapolis Lakers in his protest. Bill Russell and his protest in 1961. And um, the American Football League All-Stars here. And uh, this is the East Squad. Um, and uh, they were responsible in a way for how the Super Bowl came about, but they didn't exactly didn't exactly mean what they did. But uh, nonetheless, uh, in the 1960s, certainly a major part of the civil rights movement, there was Muhammad Ali, who refused induction into the um, United States um, military. And there's Woody Strode, and behind him is Kirk Douglas, and the movie is the 1960 movie Spartacus, which also starred a guy who went to Seward High School in Lower Manhattan, where my mother went to high school, but uh, not at the same time. A guy named Bernie Schwartz, who you might know better as 
Tony Curtis, who was in this movie. Um, so how did Woody Strode become a football player or a professional football player in the NFL? Well, it starts with a guy from New York, a guy by the name of Daniel Reeves, who owned the Cleveland Rams football team, and he loved L.A., uh, and he saw gold uh, there, and he told the Associated Press in 1946, I believe it will become the greatest professional football town in the country. Well, it really didn't. They've had problems with professional football teams there, but he went there anyway. Reeves also thought Dallas, Texas would be a good fit for him um, in the Jim Crow South, and um, that that was iffy until really the late 1960s. Uh, it's very complicated, as you see Dan Reeves getting his bust for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. NFL owners were concerned about travel costs and initially voted against Reeves' proposed move. Reeves responded by threatening to remove his team from professional football altogether. And you call this a National League, he shouted? Well, you can consider the Cleveland Rams out of pro football. And yeah, the Cleveland Rams were out of pro football, but they ended up in Los Angeles. Here was uh, the argument against the move. Uh, no major league franchise in any sport had ever called a West Coast city home before. Uh, air travel was still in its earliest stages, and well, hey, all you have to do is look at the lyrics to uh, the Bobby Troop song, Route 66, which wasn't even a hit in 1946. You know, you, Chicago, they had two teams at that point, the Bears, a Lions rival, and the Chicago Cardinals. So, uh, you know, uh, if you went on Route 66 and it went more than 2,000 miles along the way and you stopped in St. Louis and Joplin, Missouri and Oklahoma City and, and Amarillo and Gallup and uh, Winona and Flagstaff and Kingston and Barstow and San Bernardino and then finally you get to Los Angeles. So you had to take a train. And nobody had the appetite to go 2,000 miles on the train. It was a strong tr tradition for college football in Los Angeles. No tradition for pro football. In fact, uh, in the 1920s, the Los Angeles Coliseum Commission banned pro teams from its stadium. That is Kenny Washington. Went to UC, uh, UCLA. Best football player in the nation in 1939. Could not get a job in the National Football League. Uh, seven years had passed. He was way past his prime when he finally got his opportunity. Uh, the Rams owner, Daniel Reeves, had to agree to hire Negroes in 1946 as part of his agreement to move to the Los Angeles Coliseum, despite other NFL owners' opposition, particularly in Washington with George Preston Marshall, who said, hey, I'm a racist. Um, it was no big deal for him. He was from West Virginia. He was a racist. Reeves would hire Kenny Washington and Woody Strode. The NFL had a color barrier up between 1934 and 45. Getting a lease from the Los Angeles Coliseum would change the league, and some owners like Marshall and Washington and others totally, totally against it. Well, there was a guy by the name of Haley Harding, former athlete turned journalist. Uh, he was with a, the city, Los Angeles, uh, black newspaper, and he decided to get on his soapbox to tell people exactly why Los Angeles should have a National Football League team. So he was the Los Angeles Tribune sports editor, and uh, he outlined how the Coliseum was funded by public funds, uh, taxpayers, the feds, uh, and local because they built the stadium, the Coliseum, basically in order to attract the 1932 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Cleveland was also after that 1932 Olympics. Uh, but it was built with public funds and built by local people, which included African Americans. Uh, the stadium could never be used uh, by a segregated team, Harding pointed out. And he explained to the NFL owners, um, various L.A. Coliseum commissioners, and the public that in L.A., in other parts of the West, they didn't see black and white differences the way some other parts of the country did, like uh, the Jim Crow South, uh, everything south of the Mason-Dixon line, although the Mason-Dixon line is really Pennsylvania and Maryland, so not really all that big a line. It was just made famous by somebody. Uh, Harding said that blacks had served in World War II, and that comes back a little later in this talk. 
that they had been a key to much of the war preparation that had taken place in Los Angeles. They helped build and fund um, the Coliseum. And that was singularly strange that no NFL team had signed a player like Kenny Washington. Uh, and there is Kenny Washington. Uh, Kenny Washington and Woody Strode with the National Football League's Los Angeles Rams became the first two Negroes in the league since Joe Lillier suited up for the Chicago Cardinals on December 3rd, 1933. NFL said, we don't have a color barrier. It's just those guys aren't good enough. Um, they're just not good enough. It's, it's nothing against them. We wish they were better, but they can't make our league. These were part-time players who only played in the fall and had real jobs the rest of the year. This is 1918, and this picture is of Fritz Pollard, uh, Brown University player, and Paul Roberson. And uh, this is 1918, Paul Roberson, rather. And uh, Paul was a player, and so was Fritz. A total of uh, nine black players suited up for NFL teams between 1920 and 26, including Robeson, J. Mayo Williams, Fritz Pollard, Bobby Marshall. In fact, Pollard and Marshall were the first black players in 1920. Pollard was co-coach of the Akron Pros in 1921, the first African-American coach in big league sports. But in those days, big league sports, just Major League Baseball. Maybe the National Football, it wasn't even called the National Football League at that point. It was the American Professional Football Association. And the National Hockey League had just started uh, in Canada. Nine African-American players in the NFL were removed from the league at the end of the 1926 season. A handful of black players were in the league between 1928 and 1933. The NFL owners systematically removed Negro players from the league over an eight-year period. Lilliard and the Pittsburgh Pirates player Ray Kemp were the last Negro players on rosters in the NFL in 1933, and Lilliard was considered a malcontent. Strode and Washington's teammates never accepted them. There were 33 players on the Los Angeles Rams, 31 white guys, all together, and these two guys basically apart from the rest of the team. Meanwhile, uh, in 1946, a new league hit the field. It was called the All-America Football Conference. No color barrier there. Uh, it was the brainchild of uh, Arch Ward, the Chicago Tribune sports editor, who also came up with the idea of the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. And that's Paul Brown, and he is with Marion Motley, the running back for Cleveland. Bill Willis and Marion Motley were hired by Paul Brown and the Cleveland Browns. They became teammates and lifelong friends. They endured taunts, racial slurs, dirty play, all before Jackie Robinson broke in with the Brooklyn Dodgers from opponents on the field. And Paul Brown kept them home. Uh, there was a game scheduled in Miami in 1946. He kept them home because the two guys were receiving death threats. Miami, of course, being deep in the South at that point. But their teammates did welcome them. Jackie Robinson. And that is uh, Moses Fleetwood Walker, Toledo, 1884. And there were two Americas, and that picture comes from the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn. And uh, which I was struck by the Henry Ford Museum. I thought it would be a car museum. And yet, and it's Henry Ford we're talking about here. It's also a civil rights museum, which I found rather interesting. Anyway, uh, colored waiting room. Uh, and my wife is sitting there and you can see it's all dingy. There's the white waiting room and a colored waiting room for uh, buses and trains and all that. So there are two Americas in 1947. Uh, White's only drinking fountain uh, in New York City, in Manhattan, at Penn Station, which is between or was between 7th Avenue and 8th Avenue and 33rd Street, and 31st Street, a place that should never have been knocked down, which it was, and its place was a uh, new Madison Square Garden, which was built entirely wrong and has been wrong since uh, 1968, 56 years ago. Anyway, they had whites only uh, water fountain there and also colored uh, only water fountains, middle of Manhattan at a busy uh, train station. 
And uh, this one uh, is uh, in Alabama, colored entrance. And but Private uh, Joe Lewis says, uh, and this is part of uh, a museum that uh, is a, is a civil rights museum and also a Mardi Gras museum in Mobile, Alabama. So that's the uh, how the world was, at least when Jackie Robinson broke in in 1947. On April 15, 1947, Jackie Robinson, age 28, becomes the first African-American player in Major League Baseball when he steps onto Ebbets Field in Brooklyn to compete for the Brooklyn Dodgers since Moses Fleetwood Walker in 1884. Robinson broke the color barrier in a sport that had been segregated for 63 years, at least on the major league level. Walker made his debut in the American Association, one of two major leagues of the time, uh, on May 1st, 1884, as a catcher for the Toledo Blue Stockings in their game in Louisville against the Eclipse squad. The Chicago White Stockings, the um, predecessor of the Chicago Cubs or Chicago Orphans or whatever they called it through the years until they stuck to the Cubs, arrived in Toledo for an August 1883 exhibition game. And Cap Anson was Chicago's star player and manager. And he was one of the biggest stars of the game. He might have been the biggest star in baseball. And he was furious upon learning he would be facing a black player. but. When money talks, nobody walks. And there is Cap Anson. Uh, Anson grudgingly put his uh, team on the field to avoid forfeiting a share of the gate receipts, but he said he would never play again against a black man. And he was very vocal, both on and off the field, about keeping baseball segregated to the point that he was considered the father of segregated baseball. Walker played in 42 games in 1884, and now apparently he was a very good defensive catcher. Uh, in July, he had been joined by his brother, Weldy, who played a few games in the uh, outfield. Uh, but the Walker brothers' uh, major league careers were over by uh, the fall of 1884, and it had nothing to do with their ability. Uh, gentlemen's Agreement, Moses Walker, catcher for Toledo in 84, first Negro player to perform in majors. Uh, black players like Walker would soon lose their place in baseball. In 1877, major league and minor league team owners adopted a secretive gentleman's agreement or an unwritten rule that said no new contracts will be given to black players. This gentleman's agreement, similar to the Jim Crow laws of the American South, um, some American states effectively forced black players out of organized baseball by 1900. And uh, Anson had an ally. Now, I, I don't know in, in the Detroit area what you called a Spalding, um, it was a pink ball. It was uh, called in New York Spalding. Um, nobody ever called it Spalding. Uh, it was also called Pinky. And uh, we played with it. We played stoop ball with it. We played stick ball with it. Uh, we played punch ball with it. Uh, we played hit the dime or penny with it. The, if the penny flipped over, you got to keep it. Uh, but uh, we never knew as kids that this guy was Anson's ally in keeping uh, black players out of Major League Baseball or baseball in particular. He was a pitcher with, the, uh, with Boston uh, back at the time that Anson was around and he was an ally of Anson to keep blacks out. Uh, American and National League and the predecessor called the American Association, along with minor leagues like the International League, had a color barrier between 1890 and 1946. Uh, there wasn't any formal decree banning African Americans from organized baseball, but African Americans clearly were not wanted on the field or in the stands. Um, there were places like St. Louis where there was a colored area. Uh, and that's where all the colored people, and this was after World War II, all the colored people sat in the colored section. America, African Americans ended up in the Negro League or barnstorming or in Mexico or Cuba. Charlie Grant is an interesting guy. Charlie Grant was a player in the Chicagoland area. He was a pretty good player. 
And John J. McGraw was the manager of the Baltimore Orioles of the New American League. And uh, he wanted to sign Charlie Grant. Uh, in fact, he was invited to work out for McGraw. And uh, he was a light-skinned black player. But uh, he was, uh, McGraw was going to pass off Charlie Grant as a Native American. Um, and um, he was going to uh, play for McGraw's team because McGraw said he was a Cherokee by the name of Charlie Tokahama. I don't know where they got that name, Tokahama. But the White Sox owner, Charles Comiskey, apparently knew of Grant and de derailed the plan. Uh, about 104 years ago and two weeks ago, this guy, Rube Foster, uh, founded the uh, Negro National League. Uh, he was the owner of an independent all-black team called the Chicago African Giants. And uh, this starts the um, Negro League, or the start of Negro Leagues baseball. Uh, this is part of the Great Migration, where African Americans from the South headed north, particularly to the Chicago area. And uh, people like Louis Armstrong ended up in Chicago, and uh, that's jazz, man. Um, that's where the jazz all of a sudden had a home in the north in Chicago. Also, the greater population bases were in the north, and it was felt the cities in the north could better support the teams in Foster's new league. Other Negro leagues would soon sprout up as part of a large somewhat profitable baseball industry throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, I met this guy in the 1980s. Um, this guy is Sam Lacey. And Sam Lacey was the uh, editor of a Negro newspaper in Baltimore back in the 1930s. And he started pressing for integration of baseball. In 1936, he began lobbying the Washington Senators owner, Clark Griffith, to consider adding star players from the Negro Leagues, in particular those playing for the Homestead Grays team that leased uh, Griffith Stadium in Washington for its home games. And he keeps writing and writing and writing and writing that this should be done. Finally, Griffith said, I'll meet with you. And that happened in December 1937. This is what Lacey said. Uh, I use that old cliche about Washington being first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League, and that he could remedy that. But he told me that the climate wasn't right. He pointed out there were a lot of Southern baseball players in the league and that there would be, a, would be constant confrontations. And moreover, it would break up the Negro Leagues. He saw the Negro Leagues as a source of revenue. He's getting a lot of money uh, having uh, the Negro League in Griffith Stadium in Washington. Um, also, uh, the Homestead Grays played some games in Washington, and they had a catcher by the name of Josh Gibson, who may or may not have been the greatest home run hitter of all time. Um, he never got a sniff in the major leagues, not because he didn't have talent. It was the pigmentation of his skin was different. Wendell Smith was with the black newspaper in Pittsburgh, the Courier, and uh, he told Branch Rickey, the Brooklyn Dodgers general manager, who was searching for an individual with strong character to successfully execute the integration of baseball, that Jackie Robinson was his guy. Now, Ralph Kiner was a great baseball player with the Pittsburgh Pirates, led the National League in home runs about eight times. And he was here in New York. He was the New York Mets announcer for about 40 years. Um, and um, Ralph and I in the 80s would talk a lot. And Ralph told me, you know, there was a movement in New York to get African Americans, or as he said at that point, Negroes into baseball. And if you look at this protest, it says, admit Negroes to big league baseball. And there was a movement growing in New York and with trade unit, unions. Unions and civil rights groups picketed outside Yankee Stadium, the Polo Grounds, and Ebbets Field in New York City, Comiskey Park and Wrigley Field in Chicago, and they gathered more than a million signatures on petitions demanding that baseball tear down the color barrier. In July 1940, the Trade Union Athletic Association held an end Jim Crow and baseball demonstration at the New York World's Fair. At the World's Fair, he had a protest. Uh, the Wizard of Oz, now that's Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, a uh, former federal judge who helped baseball 
on its way to get an antitrust exemption. And he's brought in in 1920 after the Chicago uh, White Sox aided the players allegedly through the World Series. And he was a tough guy. He, he suspended those eight guys for life and also guys like Joe Gideon and a few others who uh, knew of the plot and didn't tell anybody that uh, the White Sox players were throwing games. But if you peeled the curtain, you got the Wizard of Oz, you know, a guy just sitting there, the all-powerful Oz. Well, how powerful was Landis? The petition asked fans if they would be willing to allow the Yankees and Dodgers or Giants to sign a black player if he was able to make the team. After a year and a half, they had over a million and a half signatures on Judge Landis' desk. Uh, fans would support black players. Now, Paul Robeson was allowed to make the case before Landis and the owners, the baseball owners, the 16 owners, in 1943 for integration. Now, Robert Robeson, Robeson rather, uh, made his presentation, which is about 90 minutes, and got no questions, none whatsoever. All the owners were instructed to just sit there, listen to him, and ask no questions. Uh, whenever he was asked point blank, the former federal judge uh, Landis, about allowing black players in the game, basically said, not my job, man, not my job. It's the owners. Ask them, 16 owners. They make up the rules. Uh, from 1941 through 45, and this is what Ralph Kiner told me as well, and others, more than one million black Americans served their country in World War II. While their military units were segregated, some play on integrated baseball teams while overseas. Now, this is a famous ad. It's not an ad that's pleasant to look at. It's from around 1945. And on the left is a black American soldier dead. On the right, is a left-handed pitcher in the Negro National League. And it says, good enough to die, but not good enough to pitch. Running for re-election to the New York City Council in 1945, Ben Davis, African-American former college football star and a communist, card-carrying communist, ended up in jail uh, later in the decade, distributed a leaflet with photos of two blacks, a dead soldier and a baseball player. Good enough to die for his country, but not good enough to pitch. And again, it was Ralph Kiner who told me about this movement going on in New York politically as well. And there's Ben Davis Jr. The New York State Legislature passed the Quinn Ives Act, which banned discrimination in hiring, and soon formed a committee to investigate discriminatory hiring practices including one that focused on baseball. And this is an interesting one because you would think it would only be, well, it's the Brooklyn Dodgers, New York Giants, New York Yankees. But there were a good number of minor league teams. There was one league called the New York Penn League. Well, actually, it's called the Pony League, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York. And they had uh, teams playing in Olean, New York. And, and there was a baseball team, Triple A team in Buffalo. And Binghamton was a big town back in those days. Uh, they had a team. So you were looking at not only the major league teams, but also the hiring practices of minor league teams. And that starts to put some heat on Major League Baseball. And there is Ralph Kiner's corner. I loved Ralph. I loved hanging out with him and hearing all the old stories. And his best friend was Hank Greenberg, the Detroit uh, Tigers superstar first baseman, who was the best man of two of the, at two of his weddings. And uh, the last one to Deanne, he said, uh, hey, how about being my best man? He said, nope. He said, three times might be a charm. Get somebody else. But Ralph and Hank Greenberg were really tight. Uh, it was just another part of the changeover of baseball. It had to happen sooner or later. It was really an aftermath of World War II, where the black players or the Negroes fought for our side. They had to be recognized. There was a movement at the time that they were going to bring black players into the game. Ricky, and Ralph hated Branch Ricky, because... Ralph played in Pittsburgh. Ricky was the general manager. Uh, he led the league in home runs. He wanted a raise of eight teams in the National League at that point. Pirates were finishing dead last every year. And Ricky said to uh, Kiner, hey, 
We could we could finish and last with you. We could finish and last without you. Anyway, he said Ricky was the man who picked Robinson, and that was a brilliant choice. Uh, Larry Doby was the second African American in Major League Baseball in 1947. And back in 1997, the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, about a week or two prior to that anniversary, I sat down and had a very long interview with Larry Doby. And um, I'm not going to repeat the entire interview because we'd be here for about a half hour. Uh, but I'll give you the highlights of this interview. Mr. Ricky, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Vec, Bill Vec, uh, the owner of the Cleveland Indians, gave me an opportunity to be in the American League. So I have to say that if Jackie had not made it, I probably would not have been given the opportunity. When you talk about what goes through your mind 50 years ago, you have to first think of Mr. Ricky, who had the courage to do it. You think of Mr. Robinson, who had the courage to do it. And you think about Mr. Vec, the Cleveland owner, who had the courage to do it, and me, who had the opportunity to do it. And there's Bill Vec on the left and the young Larry Doby. Uh, Bill Vec, I met later in life. Uh, he lost his leg uh, in World War II. I think it was World War II. It must have been World War II. He had a wooden leg. And uh, he would put the leg over the other leg. And built into the leg was an ashtray because he needed a place after he smoked his cigarette to put the ashes in. And he had it carved into his wooden leg. And I never thought, what if there was... You know, a rogue uh, spark burnt up his wooden leg and burnt him up. But anyway, there is Bill Vec and Larry Doby. A lot of people ask me, Jack gets a lot of the headlines. You don't get too much headlines. Both Doby and Robinson were in the same boat. They were verbally abused, as were the uh, four players uh, in the National Football League and All-American Football Conference uh, last fall or the fall before in 1946 and had to live a separate life on the road from their teammates in separate hotels, almost always in the poorest section of town, certain cities. It's the Green Book all over again. This was the Green Book. For those of you who don't know what the Green Book was, it was a guy named Victor Green in New York, who starting in 1938 put out a book which uh, basically told Negro motorists what roads to take on that should be safe, what restaurants you could eat in, what gas stations you could get, uh gas in and uh what hotels and motels you could stay in uh when the guy is first he should get the headlines i know myself my friends my friends know i was involved in the same type of thing he was involved in and there's jackie and there is larry doby i'm not going to be going around asking for publicity politicking for publicity but i know what i've done and i know i have helped some people to accomplish what they've done in terms of coming into the american league and it makes you feel good being part of it and that's one thing nobody could take away from me i think a lot of people think because i was 11 weeks behind jackie it made it easier for me and that's not true we talked about it I would not say we were close from a social standpoint, but we barnstormed for about four years for 30 days. I'd see him at certain functions, but we stayed away from the negatives. Another picture of uh, Larry and Jackie. The only thing we talked about, there were certain guys who gave him a tough time, and I had certain guys in the American League that gave me a tough time. You see, the focus was trying to be the best ball player you could be, and you had to because when you're talking about eight teams, you know you get hurt and you, you might get back. Uh, you had to concentrate on playing the game as well as you can. And one of the other things, and I think he felt the same way I felt, why stir things up? It is tough enough going through the summer, going through what you are going uh, to go through. You don't want to go through to talk about the same thing during the winter. Let's talk about something positive. Let's be comfortable. Let's be happy. And there is Wally Triplett, uh, Wally Triplett rather, Wally Triplett of Detroit. Um, Wally's an interesting character. He was a great high school football player. And back in the 1940s, the way schools recruited, they just read about your exploits. And he was recruited by the University of Miami. And they were going to give him a scholarship. And he wrote a letter to the athletic director saying, do you know I'm a Negro? And he got a letter back saying, thanks. Good luck in your future. Uh, Wally really didn't want to play in Miami. Wally Triplett was a chauffeur, confidant card-playing buddy of Jackie Robinson. 
He made sure Jackie always got a home-cooked meal when Robinson played in Philadelphia when Brooklyn played the Philadelphia Phillies. Philadelphia may have been the toughest place in all of baseball for Robinson, but Wally Triplett and his family made it easier for Jackie and provided an oasis away from the pressures that Robinson was facing. Philadelphia was the worst team in the league for taunting, said Triplett, who in his own right was a sports pioneer, by being one of the first Negro players ever to play college football on the field in Texas as a member of the Penn State football team that went to the Cotton Bowl. Triplett was Penn State's first Negro player. Philadelphia is, the, is where they threw the black cat on the field. And if you notice that picture, you'll notice something rather interesting. Ben Chapman, the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, and Jackie Robinson. Now, the photographers, now, well, let's get the story first. Ben Chapman was a bench jockey, uh, which is a term for somebody who just cursed out people, called them all kinds of names, trying to break concentration. And he, Hank Greenberg, uh, he was the kike. Joe DiMaggio was the big Dago, and he called Robinson all kinds of awful names. And Chapman defended himself by saying, well, a lot of people do that. Uh, it's just part of the game. Now, the photographers wanted them to shake hands. Jackie refused. So somebody gave him a bat. Jackie holds the bat uh, and poses for the picture. Uh, Jackie looks a little more receptive to the picture. Chapman doesn't look receptive at all. Uh, so he's managing the Phillies, and he made his opposition to Jackie Robinson loud and clear. He spew insults to Robinson from the dugout, ordered his pitchers to beam the rookie on three and oak counts rather than walking him. Chapman's antics caused many in baseball to sympathize with Robinson. Now, this is outside of uh, the uh, New York Mets uh, owned Brooklyn Cyclones baseball team, double A baseball. And it's a statue. Uh, on the left is Pee Wee Reese, on the right is Jackie Robinson. And this may have happened or may not have happened. Uh, allegedly, Pee Wee Reese put his arm around Jackie after Jackie had a really rough time uh, with Ben Chapman and after colliding with Hank Greenberg. Uh, there's a famous story, and it's not in the movie 42, where Robinson and Greenberg um, collide at first base, and everybody expected a fight between Hank and Jackie. And both of them dusted themselves off, and Hank told uh, who, who he was. Uh, Hank was uh, uh, subject of all kind of ra of anti-Semitic taunts in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, Hank told uh, Jackie, "Don't let the bastards get you." Um, well, it may have happened, may not have happened. But Robinson went on to say that the Chapman-led racism actually helped bring the Dodgers team closer. Perhaps Pee Wee Reese put his arm around Jackie in the following game, maybe not. Dodgers would win 94, lose 60 that year. Jackie was the rookie of the year and the team reached the World Series, lost to the New York Yankees. And that happened a lot. Uh, now, there is a very weird connection, um, three-way connection between Wally Triplett, Jackie Robinson, and Joe Tepsik. Now, baseball historians say I'm crazy for even bringing this up. But my question is, why would Wally Triplett lie about this? It makes absolutely no sense. And here's the story. Triplett had that very weird connection to Robinson through Joe Tepsik. Tepsik befriended Triplett while the two were at Penn State. Uh, Tepsik would sign a contract with Brooklyn and have a clause where he could not be sent down to the minors. In 1946, Tepsik was a struggling player with Brooklyn while Robinson was with the Dodgers AAA team in Montreal, the Montreal Royals. Uh, and this is Wally Triplett. Uh, now, let me tell you about Wally. I befriended him. He was about 80 years old. I have no reason why I befriended him. I have no idea. I don't know how we got together, but it was through email. And he sent me an email. I sent him one back. And we became friends. Uh, Wally would be probably, what, about 95 now. So I was, you know, about 52, 53 years old when uh, we became friends. Jackie signed in 1945, October 23rd, and was sent to Montreal. Uh, I was at Penn State and met Tepsik. Tepsik and I became close friends. 
1946, Brooklyn manager Leo DeRocher wanted Jackie and asked Tepsic to go down to Montreal. Tepsic said no. Tepsic had signed with Brooklyn and had a clause in his contract that he could decline going to the minor leagues. He delayed Jackie until 1947. He would not go down. Historians say he's full of it. I said, well, why would he be full of it when he and Jackie rode together in 1947 and became very friendly. Why would he do that? According to the accounts available, the newspaper clippings from 1946, yeah, Tepsic's teammates were hoping that he would accept the demotion and the team would pick up a veteran pinch hitter. Now, there's no indication Brooklyn would have added Robinson, but Triplett said Dodgers manager Leo DeRocher wanted Jackie. Jackie signing in 1945 with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Jackie made his Major League debut on uh, April 15th and soon afterwards became friendly with Triplett. Wally had been around baseball as a kid. His father had worked for Ed Bolden's Philadelphia Stars Negro League team. He knew Satchel Page. He knew others through his father, and he struck up a conversation with Robinson after a game in Philadelphia and took him home. Uh, he would do the same thing for Major League Baseball second Negro player Cleveland's Larry Doby. Later on in the 1947 season, Philadelphia had two Major League teams, the National League Phillies and the American League A's. Connie Mack, the owner and manager of the A's, wasn't too keen on allowing Negroes into his stadium to watch the A's. And he probably was part of uh, the group that kept Negroes out of baseball. He started in 1901 as a Phillies as the A's manager. So here's Jackie, uh, and here's Triplett. It took Jackie home. Let's kill some time. Uh, my mother cooked him special rolls in greens for him. My mother fell in love with him. He was a nice guy. Branch Rickey selected Jackie because he knew he could withstand the guff. He's a nice person. We used to play pinochle all night. Then I'd drive him back to the hotel. He always got a meal from my mother. So why Jackie? Why not Larry Doby? Why not Satchel Page? As you see the three of them in that picture. Triplett has an interesting insight into baseball history. He understood why Robinson, not Larry Doby or Satchel Page, was the first Negro player in Major League Baseball since the 1880s. Jackie was a good diplomat. Larry Doby always thought he should have been the first, but uh, Doby wasn't as bubbly a personality as Satchel. It's more a matter of fact in personality than Jackie. Uh, Doby hated Satchel. Didn't like him at all, as he told me one day. He said, uh, and this, this sounds, uh, sounds bad. Uh, he said he was step and fetch it. Step and fetch it. An old character from way back when. Uh, meant to bring down uh, 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 the, uh, the Negro profile, step and fetch it. Uh, after baseball, well, Jackie was traded by the Brooklyn Dodgers to the New York Giants for Dick Littlefield, but he never played with the Giants. Uh, he made um, his announcement in, in a magazine that was either Look or Life. He was retiring from baseball and joining Chock Full of Nuts, the Heavenly Coffee. Uh, 1956, he became an executive with the Chock Full of Nuts restaurant chain and advocate for integrating corporate America, lent his name and prestige to several business ventures, including a construction company in a black-owned bank in Harlem. Never got a baseball job offer. And there is Wally Triplett. That was his name, uh, email. Uh, Negroes finally listed at AOL.com. His NFL uh, shirt from 1949. And uh, he was the first African-American player ever drafted by a team in the NFL by Detroit 1949. And he was also one of two uh, Negro Penn State players who desegregated Dallas's Cotton Bowl in 1948. Dennis Huggard was the other. 1947, the Cotton Bowl in Dallas wanted Penn State to play SMU, Southern Methodist University, in the January 1st, 1948 game. Uh, but they did not want Wally Triplett to play. And there he is. He is playing in the Cotton Bowl for Penn State. Uh, Penn State players, led by uh, Steve Suey, whose son Matt Suey was a player with the Chicago Bears in the 1980s, 1990s, um, said, we're Penn State. 
we're all going together. Negro players are part of the team. And today there's a slogan, we're Penn State. That's where that started with Wally Triplett. Penn State's opponent, Southern Methodist University, came up with a suggestion. Stay at the Dallas Naval Air Station. Penn State accepted, practiced at the military installation, and played the game. This guy is Ernest Jenke, and he was an International Olympic Committee delegate from the United States, also a former sec Assistant Secretary of War for the United States. Um, and he sees what's going on, and he's outraged with what's going on in Hitler's Germany, and on November 25th, 1935, he sends a letter to the International Olympic Committee President Count Henri Ballet Latour. Uh, you hang around the Olympics. Well, one thing that you learn hanging around the International Olympic Committee, like once in the, uh, one Antonio Samaranch who ran the IOC, so after you shake hands, make sure you still have five fingers there. A lot of counts and earls and lords and sirs all around uh, uh, the uh, IOC, most of them from Europe. Anyway, he says, we got to boycott the 1936 Berlin Games. His letter, neither Americans nor the representatives of other countries can take part in the games in Nazi Germany without at least acquiescent in, acquiescing in the contempt of the Nazis for fair play and their sordid exploitation of the games. The letter seemed to go unanswered. Jenke, the former assistant secretary for the United States Navy, was still getting reports. He was of German descent. He was thrown out of the exclusive club known as the International Olympic Committee by July 1936, his spot taken by the racist anti-Semitic Avery Brundage. Uh, that's Judge Jeremiah Mahoney, December 8th, 1935. And and he is calling for a boycott. In April 1933, an Aryans-only policy was instituted in all German athletic organizations. Non-Aryans, Jews, or individuals with Jewish parents and Romers, gypsies, were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. This is uh, the boycott uh, and the reasons behind it, Jeremiah Mahoney. There's no room for discrimination on grounds of race, color, or creed in the Olympics. The AAU voted in 1933 to accept an invitation to compete at Berlin in 1936, provided Germany pledged that there would be no discrimination against Jewish athletes. If that pledge is not kept, I personally do not see why we should compete. Well, Ben Johnson, who was a sprinter, who was chosen to the team by Mahoney, who was in charge of uh, putting together the team as the head of the AAU disagrees with Mahoney. Um, the Negro in the South is discriminated against as much as the Jews in Germany. It's futile and hypocritical that Judge Mahoney should attempt to clean up conditions in Germany before cleaning up similar conditions in America. Well, Franklin Roosevelt wasn't going to get involved. He said the athletes should go and play. That's their job, go and play. And he urged the American team to go to Berlin. And Jesse Owens would steal the show. And Jesse Owens was the replacement for Marty Glickman, a guy I worked with in 1988 with the Marty Glickman Broadcasting School, which was to break in announcers like Leandra Riley. Less said about her abilities, the better. But I was working with her all for 100 bucks, which I never got because Marty died. Uh, Nazi Germany used the 1936 Olympic Games for propaganda purposes. The Nazis promoted an image of a new strong and united Germany while masking Germany's growing militarism. Adolf Hitler was born in Australia, or rather Austria, I'm sorry, Austria. And he wasn't blonde and he wasn't blue eyes or didn't have blue eyes, but he thought that was the perfect Aryan, even though he looked the way he did. And there's Marty Glickman, 18 years old in this picture. Sam Stoller, 21 years old in this picture. And I knew both of them. I work with Marty. Sam ran the Milrose Games. Marty, if you've ever met him and said, good morning, Marty, how are you? He would say, may that Avery Brundage rot in hell in the seventh ring of hell. Where Sam would just say, oh, hi, how are you doing? Sam was quiet. Marty was from Brooklyn. He never shut up. He never shut up. Fastest kid in Brooklyn. That's the title of his autobiography, which you might have in the library. The day before the event, the four by 100 meter relay, the two were replaced by Jesse Owens 
and Ralph Metcalf, the team's two fastest sprinters. Coaches claim they needed their fastest runners to win the race. Glickman said that the coach, Dean Cromwell, and Avery Brundage were motivated by anti-Semitism and a desire to spare the Fuhrer the embarrassing sight of two American Jews on the winning podium. Um, Marty told me that it was his intention. He was going to run. They were going to win the gold medal. He was going to be up there with Sam, and they were going to shove that medal right into the Fuhrer's face in his box where he watched all the uh, Olympic action. Sower didn't believe that uh, anti-Semitism was involved, but the then 21-year-old described the incident in his diary as the most humiliating episode in his life. The uh, thing that amazes me, there was another Jewish athlete who did not compete. Her name was Gretel Bergman, and uh, she was German, and um, she played along right until the end, until 1935. Um, and... Um, I interviewed her and I, I do a talk on the Hitler Olympics, a, a separate talk on the Hitler Olympics. And um, she, I interviewed her, I knew Marty, Sam, this is 88 years ago, which means I must be old. Although Gretel Bergman died in 2017 at the age of 103. Anyway, getting back to Marty, we were shocked. Sam was completely stunned. He didn't say a word in the meeting. I was a brash 18-year-old kid. I said, Coach, you can't hide world-class sprinters. At which point, Jesse spoke up and said, Coach, I won my three gold medals, the 100, 200, and long jump. Tired. I've had it. Let Marty and Sam run. They deserved it, said Jesse. And Cromwell pointed his finger at him and said, You'll do as you're told. And in those days, black athletes did as they were told. Jesse was quiet after that. And uh, Wyckoff and Draper remained, and there's Jesse, and there's Ralph Metcalf. On August 3rd, 1936, Jesse Owens won the first of his four gold medals in the following categories. 100 meter, 200 meter, the long jump, four by 100 meter relay race. Uh, he replaced Marty Glickman. In fact, Jesse didn't even know how to uh, pass the baton. Marty had to teach him how to do that. It's almost like the American coach, Dean Cromwell, was going to sabotage the chance of the gold medal because of Marty and Sam. Owens was the most successful athlete at the 1936 Berlin Summer Games, and as a black man, he dispelled Adolf Hitler's idea of Aryan supremacy. Uh, but Jesse Owens was snubbed by Franklin Roosevelt. Hitler didn't snub me, it was Roosevelt who snubbed me. The president didn't even send me a telegram. Roosevelt never publicly acknowledged Owens' triumphs or the triumphs of any of the other 18 African-Americans who competed at the Berlin Games. Uh, that included uh, Louise uh, Stokes, uh, who was the first African-American woman ever to uh, compete in the Olympics, and Tidy Pickett. Uh, only white Olympians were invited to the White House in 1936. Relatives of Jesse Owens and 17 other African Americans who competed at the 1936 Olympics were welcomed to the White House by President Barack Obama in 2016 in the celebration of their lives and accomplishments. Why the snub? All about politics. Roosevelt was running for re-election, probably didn't want to upset members of his own party, Southern Democrats, who enacted Jim Crow laws after the Civil War. He still wanted the votes although he did listen to Eleanor in 1939 and allowed Marian Anderson to sing at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, Joe Lewis from Detroit. Lewis held the world heavyweight title for 12 years through 24 bouts longer than anyone before or since. When the United States entered World War II, Lewis enlisted in the army. Might be a lot wrong with America, but nothing Hitler can fix. Uh, he said, fought exhibition matches to raise money for the armed services, boost morale for the troops, made donations to military relief funds. Historian Jeffrey Salmon said, Joe Lewis set a stunning example through his acts of patriotism, and even the South responded appreciatively. Okay, now uh, most of that stuff happened in the 30s and 40s, and I'm going to the 1960s where this thing is going to reach its natural end. Elgin Baylor was a player with the Minneapolis Lakers in 1959. And in those days, uh, if somebody offered the NBA money, had the court, threw the court down in the middle of a parking lot, uh, and they gave uh, the NBA money, 
you can have an exhibition game or a regular season game at a neutral site. On January 16th, 1959, Elgin Baylor, who I knew throughout the year. In fact, I always mixed him up. He looked a lot like Nipsey Russell when he had his uh, wig uh, back in the 80s. They, I, I swear they were separated at birth. Anyway, Nipsey Russell, by the way, marched with the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Baylor refused uh, to, to play the neutral site game for the Lakers against the Cincinnati Royals in segregated Charleston, West Virginia. Baylor and his black teammates could not stay at the all-white hotel with the rest of the team. And there is the newspaper, Hotel Snubs Baylor. He refuses to play. Lakers lose to Cincinnati. Lakers play and eat as a team. I love basketball. I like playing in the league very much, but not at the expense of my dignity. He is the first guy to protest. There will be more to follow. And there is Baylor, and there is the Minneapolis, Los Angeles Lakers owner, Bob Short. Uh, Bob Short and the NBA president, Maurice Podoloff, were irate. Podoloff publicly sided with Baylor, and the league ultimately made a rule that teams would not play in segregated states unless the teams were guaranteed share the combinations for all players. Walter Beach. Uh, Walter Beach is still a civil rights activist, um, went to Central Michigan University. And I have something in common with him. On April 15, 1999, up in Mount Pleasant at Central Michigan University, I gave a talk about the business and politics of sports. So I have that in common with Walter Beach. Well, Walter Beach was a player with the Boston Patriots in the American Football League in 1960 and 1961. And the Boston Patriots team was scheduled to play a preseason game in uh, New Orleans, segregated New Orleans, Jim Crow, New Orleans. Uh, Walter Beach was fired by the AFL's Boston Patriots in 1961, labeled a troublemaker by the owner Billy Sullivan for organizing a protest among the black players against the segregated living conditions during the team's road trip for a preseason game in New Orleans. This is one of those 36-hour road trips. Uh, he wa wanted to be, he said, I'm part of this team. So are those guys. How could you say we're a team when you're sending us to the other side of town? But Billy Sullivan said, eh, we're still a team. Goodbye. Walter Beach ended up with Cleveland, won an NFL championship with the Cleveland Browns franchise in 1964. A couple months later, another Boston professional athlete, Bill Russell, stages a boycott in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. While in Lexington, Kentucky for an exhibition uh, game before the 1961-62 season, Bill Russell and other mem black members of the Boston Celtics were refused service at a restaurant. They boycotted the game. Blacks were still expected to not complain publicly about discrimination. Bill Russell, Casey Jones, took Seth Sanders and Sam Jones to see Celtics coach Red Arbeck told Red, we're leaving, said it was because it was important to me that everybody everywhere knows that the black players are deciding they'll stand up for themselves. The Lexington boycott against the St. Louis Hawks, and there is uh, Bill Russell. That is not a game in Lexington, Kentucky. It's just a game between Boston and St. Louis. Sam Jones and Tom, Thomas Satch Sanders, Tom Satch Sanders, were refused service in the coffee shop at the team hotel in Lexington. We had gone downstairs to eat and they said, well, we really can't serve you people, uh, Sanders said in 2018. A fifth black player for the Celtics, rookie L. Butler, left with them, and two black players for the Hawks joined the boycott. One of those St. Louis players was Cleo Hill, first round uh, pick earlier that year who was denied service in Lexington. Russell had clout, Hill didn't. There is Cleo Hill on the right. That's Bob Pettit on the left. That is a game uh, between St. Louis and Syracuse. During the 1991, uh, rather the 1961-62 season, St. Louis coach Paul Seymour was told by team management, the owner Ben Kerner, to severely diminish Hill's offensive role so that the stars Bob Pettit and Cliff Hagen and Clyde Lavalette, who were all white, would receive more shots. Seymour refused. He was fired, replaced by Fuzzy Levin, whose real name was Levenny. 
Uh, and then Pivot and Hill's scoring averages, or and then Pivot and Hill's uh, scoring average dropped from 10.8 points per game to 5.5 points per game. Hill never played in the NBA after that season. He later said he didn't think race played a part in ending his career. You tell me if he's right or wrong. Uh, AD, Al Davis. I worked with John Madden for 15 years, so I got to know some of these guys with the Raiders, uh, like Jim Otto, the blonde-haired guy on the right who inexplicably is still alive, considering all he has gone through because of football. Anyway, Freddie the Hammer Williamson's there, and Clement Daniels, and Art Powell, and L. Davis, civil rights pioneer, yes. In August 1963, six African-American members of the Oakland Raiders refused to play in an exhibition game versus the New York Jets at Ladd Stadium Mobile, uh, which had segregated seating. Mobile hosted three prior American Football League preseason games in 1960, 61, and 62. And there is Al Davis, the rookie coach of Oakland at that point. Clement Daniels, Art Powell, Bo Roberson, Fred Williamson, Proverb Jones, Eugene White said no. They were backed by Al Davis. That is Mobile, Lad Peebles Stadium today. Uh, Reed Schusler Jr. was the Lad Stadium manager in 1963, and you tell me how condescending this is. We don't want four boys from Oakland telling us how to run our stadium. We're going to integrate quietly. Now we're going to go ahead as in the past for other exhibition games here. I wanted to play in Mobile before an integrated crowd and contribute in a small way to breaking down these needless prejudices, said Clement Daniels. The game was played in Oakland. The AFL never returned to Mobile. The 1965 Senior Bowl in Mobile was integrated, although the organizers reluctantly did so. And this came after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law on July 7th by President Lyndon Johnson. That's Cookie Gilchrist. He is uh, a member of the Buffalo Bills, and he's a member of the American Football League All-Star Team in 1964 and 65, and there is an All-Star game scheduled in New Orleans. Uh, the American Football League was the only league at the time to truly embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field with white players. Uh, these are dejected American Football League All-Stars because the game was never played in New Orleans. Uh, Butch uh, Bird is the guy on the right, Earl Faison with a fedora in the back, and Clinton, uh, Curtis McClinton uh, with what looks like airplane tickets in his hands, which is what they were, and they're getting out of Dodge. Well, they're getting out of New Orleans. Uh, why New Orleans? They didn't have an American Football League franchise in New Orleans. Well, why? Why New Orleans? Well, New Orleans leader said the city was going to welcome the AFL All-Stars with 22 black players with open arms. Segregation, Jim Crow, that's ending. It's over. City desperately wanted a professional team. And the American Football League, well, the black players and the white players were kind of equal. If you look at this program, um, forget about Henry, well, you can't forget about Henry Stram. You can never forget about Henry Stram, especially if you interview them. Uh, Whacked out guy. Anyway, and Pop Ivy, the coach, um, the coaches for the East and West. There are eight players out there from the eight teams. Three of the guys are black. Five of them are white. 37.5% of the players on that program are white. NFL scouts went to watch players from the big time schools and conferences. The AFL looked for players with different background, a uh, different background from the black schools, such as Grambling and Bethune Cookman and Prairie View and Texas A&I. Uh, ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed the black college football program since the best players could attend the big schools like Alabama or Auburn or Florida or Florida State or Miami or Tennessee or Arkansas or Louisiana State or Mississippi or North Carolina, you know, the old Confederacy. Uh, the players would be welcome with open arms. I don't know if you want to mess with this guy, Ernie Ladd, 6'9", 312 pounds. And uh, well, before I get into his story, let's talk about the other stories. Uh, for the black players, uh, the experience at the New Orleans airport was the first bad sign. Cab after cab passed Clement Daniels, even as white players zoomed off 
without having to wait. When a black player went to hop in with a white player, the cabbie could say, no can do. The black players were denied access to some restaurants and nightclubs in the French Quarter. Uh, one player, Ernie Ladd, is walking with Ernie 6'9". Earl Faison's about 6'4", 6'5". Dick Westmoreland's about 6'2". Huge football players. And they're walking down Bourbon Street. And they hear James Brown blasting out of the Playboy Club. And they decide to go in. And the bouncer is about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, said, I wouldn't go in there if I were you. Ernie Davis tore, rather, Ernie Ladd tore the door off the hinges and claimed that the bouncer, who said, I told you, don't go in there, pulled a gun on them when he tried to enter the club. They fled. They were called all kinds of names. They were spit at. They were thrown, things were thrown at them. That's my buddy Abner Haynes, lives in Dallas, still around in his 80s. First African-American, Native uh, American player to play college football on a regular basis in Texas uh, in 1956. He wanted uh, me to write a book with him about his story. I said, I don't write biographies and I don't have the time, but he's, we were talking anyway, so you're gonna get a story uh, out of this. Abner Haynes, David Grayson were teammates with the Kansas City Chiefs. Abner told me when the players got to New Orleans, name, rank, and serial number. Abner Haynes, running back Kansas City Chiefs, member of the American Football League All-Star team. Well, the Cavs did come. Somebody called Jack Kemp, who was the president of the American Football League Players Association, called Bud Adams, the owner of the Houston Oilers, who called the governor, John McKeithen of Louisiana, saying our guys are stuck there, uh, our black guys are stuck there. So McKeithen sent the colored Cavs to get the colored players. Uh, Abner and David get to the Hotel Roosevelt, and they check in, and it's fine. Then they go to the elevator, which is one of these old hand-cranked elevators, complete with the gate that opens up, and there's a white woman, an elderly white woman, sitting there, and she looks up and says, Hey, monkeys, what are you doing here? Abner. They had a woman operating the elevator, and she said, You monkeys, come on in and get to the back. Finally, we had about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We're talking sensibly. We're going to stay together. This was just another test. We had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. Football players took the lead. Actually, it was Elgin Baylor who took the lead. Well, maybe Wally Trippett way back when. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, and Miami were death holes. David Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us. Uh, Guys like him, Jack Kemp, who was running for president in this picture with me in Spark Hill, New York in 1979 in May. And I'm 23 years old. And this will never be duplicated. You won't see a presidential candidate talking one on one to a 23 year old radio guy anymore because most radio stations have no news departments anymore. Uh, years later, uh, I showed the picture to Jack to get it signed, and Jack looked at me and he said, uh, what happened to your hair? I said, what happened to your wig? It's powder white. See? Jack Kemp, 2003, with my son. Powder white wig. One of the things we, the AFL, needed for the unity of the white players and black players for our new league. When the white players, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City defensive leader, and four or five other guys heard about what was happening, their character showed, and my teammates were looking after me. Uh, in 2014, members of the Los Angeles Clippers National Basketball Association's franchise decided that they were going to walk out on the owner, Donald Sterling, uh, after he had a tape released, by, uh, well, a tape of him released, by um, his mistress, V. Stellinio, uh, and he told uh, V. Stellinio, you're bringing too many black guys to our games. Uh, it was on TMZ, Harvey Levin. That was the only one who was ever going to break that story. Um, and uh, the players decided to walk out. Well, there was one guy I know I could talk to who had experience with that. I met Ron Mix in 1997 and called him up and said, Ron, I need, I need your comments here. Um, and the difference between what's going on in 2014 and 1965. That's what he said. We were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game to demonstrate to the American Football League and National Football League they could support the football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was assist them in demonstrating they could support a franchise. A boycott 
was the only alternative for the players. That is Mayor Victor Shiro, uh, who wasn't too sympathetic about the boycott. Uh, he said, hey, the black players, they should have rolled with the punches. You can have a gun pulled on you. Well, no big deal. The jo governor, John McKeithen, said there are some clubs down on Bourbon Street that won't even let our district attorney, Jim Garrison, in. And maybe with good reason. He was peddling Kennedy assassination conspiracy theories at that time. The game was played in Houston. New Orleans was on the outside looking in. Eventually, New Orleans would become a political pawn. The NFL traded a franchise, a new uh, franchise to Congress, uh, to uh, the representatives, uh, Representative Hale Boggs, Koki Roberts' father, and uh, Senator Russell Long. They made the deal. We'll trade the franchise for your votes. Uh, and uh, they got the merger between the National Football League and the American Football League, and the Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. There is Muhammad Ali and me in 1985, and Ali couldn't speak at that point. The Parkinson's had kicked in. He identified with Jack Jones, uh, Jack Johnson, rather, the uh, heavyweight champion of the world back in the 19 teens. The 1968 Broadway play with James Earl Jones was based on the life of Jack Johnson. Ali said, take the issue of white women and replace it with religion, and that's my story. Johnson dated white women and was married three times, all to white women, the Mann Act. Congress passed the Mann Act in 1909. William Howard Taft signed it into law in 1910. The law made it illegal to transport any girl or woman over state lines for any immoral purpose. There'd be a lot of guys in jail if that, um, if that law was really enacted. Johnson was arrested, sent to jail for a year. It was basically aimed at him. He would flee to Europe after getting out of jail. President Donald Trump pardoned him in 2018. Charlie Chaplin and Chuck Berry were arrested under the Mann Act. Ali refused military service. Why should they ask me to put on the uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? Oh, there is me on the right asking Ali the question, and you know it's me, uh, or that person there who is me, uh, asking the question because the microphone was pulled back. Ali was drafted by the United States military in 1966, called up for induction in 1967. He attended the induction but refused to an uh, answer his name or take the oath. This led to Ali's arrest and conviction, which in June 1971 was overthrown by the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, Walter Beach is back there. Yeah, Walter Beach, Cleveland Summit. John Wooten is there. Flea Roberts. Wooten has uh, got the dark suit on the right side. Flea Roberts, uh, another friend of mine there. Bobby Mitchell with the beard uh, on the left side. Walter Beach is uh, there too. Bobby Mitchell has got the suit and tie third from the left. Bill Russell, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, and then Lou Alcindor, the Cleveland Summit. I felt with Ali taking the position he was taking, with him losing the crown, with the government coming at him with everything they had, that we as a body of prominent athletes could get the truth and stand behind Ali and give him the necessary support. They met with him and they decided he was cool. They supported him. Uh, Irv Cross was on the CBS NFL Today show back in the 70s. And uh, for some reason, we hooked up. He was a big fan of my writing. And about four years ago, he gets in touch with me prior Super Bowl. He says, hey, you know, what are you up to? And I said, I'm doing the, the Super Bowl talk. And he said, you're going to talk about the quota. I said, yeah, I'm going to talk about the quota. Well, there